sing with me the great is our God. And oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. And that is the most exciting news. We're going to take a break this morning from our study through Second Peter. Obviously, we're going to be talking about the events surrounding the death and the burial and the resurrection of our Lord. We're going to be in Matthew's Gospel, actually, this morning. But before we begin there, I want to read four verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As kind of an introduction to this message this morning. And I would like you to stand right now, if you could, as we read these four verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures." Lord God, we thank you for this truth right here, that you died for our sins, you were buried, and you rose again. This morning, Holy Spirit, may this truth come alive more and more in our hearts, the hearts of everyone here, the hearts of more and more people around this world, even, God. And we ask you now, Holy Spirit, to be our teacher. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul, and by the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the, really the, the fullest description of the resurrection we have in the Bible. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in which the Apostle Paul lays out proofs for the resurrection. He talks about the impact of the resurrection, the importance of the resurrection. A wonderful, wonderful chapter. In fact, the last two Easter's we've studied it, if you might recall. But I just want to turn your attention to that verses 3 and 4, where the Apostle Paul lays out the gospel message. Now he says back in verse 1, this is the gospel that he declares and preaches. And what is the gospel? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ, and all that he is, as the Son of God, fully God, fully man, holy, 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 that Christ died for our sins. And we know we all have tremendous, tremendous sin. Born dead in sin. From the moment we're conceived, we're dead in sin, destined for hell. Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried. And that he rose again the third day. According to the scriptures. That right there is a good summary of the gospel. Now, the gospel really doesn't just stop there. The gospel really is the grace of God which continues even after you're saved. The gospel never stops. The gospel never stops in your life. Its power never stops. The entire word of God is, in essence, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel message. But a great summary of that gospel message is found right there. It's about Jesus Christ and his work, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Well, with that said, I want us to spend some time this morning looking at each of those elements, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And for that, we turn to Matthew's Gospel. As you know, all four Gospels include accounts of these tremendous events, the most important events in world history, being the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at Matthew's this morning. We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 27 and at verse 45. Now at this point, Jesus has already been 
arrested. He's already been tried six times. By the way, Jesus went through six unlawful trials the night before his death. He's already been sentenced to death. He's already been hanging on the cross for a while. That's where we pick it up now in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. And again, first of all, we're going to look at the death of Christ. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. The sixth hour means it was 12 o'clock. Obviously, this is a supernatural darkness. From 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, a darkness over all the land, which, by the way, even secular historians of the time have made note of. And so this is not just something that is in the Bible. This is something even secular historians have noted. We know the Word of God is true, and it's, that, that's bared out all the time. But 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, a darkness, which I would argue, and I think you would too, is very fitting, as the light of the world is currently dying for sin, experiencing his darkest moment, which would of course become one of our greatest moments, as he hung and he bled and he died for our sins. But it's fitting Again, as the light of the world dies for sin, that darkness descends upon the world. And then in verse 46, and about the ninth hour, so three hours now, this darkness is in the world. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama septachni. That is to say, my God, my God, why Hast thou forsaken me? If you're unaware, that's a direct quote from Psalm 22. Psalm 22, a psalm that David wrote, which we realize, especially because of the cross of Jesus and the words of Jesus, that's a psalm about the Messiah, specifically about the crucifixion. Of the Messiah. If you read Psalm 22, it's 31 verses long, and it is directly about the crucifixion of our Lord. And in Psalm 22, verse 1, that direct quote, it begins, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The answer to that question of why God had forsaken Jesus for that time, is actually found in Psalm 22, verse 3, where we read, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Why did God the Father have to forsake God the Son for that time? Because God the Son was bearing the sin of the world. Now, we talk about grace all the time here. If you've come here, you know that we talk about grace so much. It is the number one message of the Bible. It is the number one message of the New Testament. It is the grace of God and the incredible grace and mercy that God shows believers. Yes, he shows grace and mercy to everyone, but he shows a tremendous amount of infinite grace and mercy to his children that the lost world will never know apart from repentance. Yet with that said, grace cannot be grace until sin is first sin. If we do not understand just how sinful our sin is, we can in no way begin to comprehend how gracious grace is. We get an idea of how sinful sin is because of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Think about this. If there was another way in which God could have won grace for this lost world, don't you think he would have done it? If there was another way other than sending his own son into this lost world to be born as a man, to live as a man, to die as a criminal, to bear the sin of the world, which, by the way, as excruciating as the physical aspect of Jesus' death was, 
And the word excruciating actually comes from the word crucifixion. There is no more excruciating way to die. Jesus suffered physically worse than anyone else has or will ever suffer. Yet as excruciating as the physical aspect of Jesus' death, the spiritual anguish of a holy, holy, holy God bearing sin is much, much worse. And for that time as he hung on that cross and he bore our sin. And his own father had to forsake him. Why? Because God cannot even look upon sin. Sin is such an attack against the character and nature of God. God hates sin so much. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 53, we read that it actually gave God pleasure to pour out his wrath upon his son because at that moment his son was bearing sin. That is how much God hates sin. That even if it's upon his own son, he has pleasure to pour out his wrath upon it because he hates sin so much. So for God the Father to watch his son go through that, for God the Son to go through that, that gives us some small idea of just how sinful sin is. And that's why when the Bible tells us that we are dead in sin, Ephesians chapter 2, and from the moment Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis 3, man has been dead, and man is born dead. From that very moment, we're running and hiding from God, afraid of God. We're destined for hell because God hates sin so much. And again, this gives us an idea of just how much he hates it. His own son, bearing the sin of the world, he had to forsake him. God the Father had to forsake God the Son as he died on that cross. <clears throat> so yes, God is incredibly gracious, but we cannot even begin to think about grace until we understand how sinful sin is. And then that then gives grace its power when we understand what it cost God to win grace for us. This is what the cost of grace was. Again, there was no lesser cost. There was no other means of grace available. This is it. Something that would cost God this much pain. That's the pain that you and I should have endured. We're the ones that put Jesus on that cross. Every single one of us. Every single person who has ever lived put Jesus Christ on that cross. Every single one of us deserves to be on that cross. Every single one of us, this moment, right now, as we speak, deserves to be in hell. We deserve to be thrown into the lake of fire, as the demons and all the lost men will be at the end of this world. But because of what Jesus did, we don't have to be. But again, I hope we begin to understand how sinful sin is. That God the Father had to forsake his own Son as he bore it. So my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And by the way, that's something to keep in mind next time you or I think we're having a quote-unquote bad day. This is something to keep in mind. There is no worse day than the day Jesus had. And yet there was no greater victory than the victory Jesus won. And we need to keep that in mind every single day. Not just today. You know, today is not any greater than any other day. Every single day is a day that Jesus is risen. Every single day is a day in which the fullness of the blessings of God are available to the child of God. There's nothing special about Easter Sunday or Christmas or anything. Every single day, as the New Testament makes clear, is the same. And we need to understand that every single day these things are true. Every single day the grace of God is available for the believer. And so we praise God for that. But again, Jesus bearing the sin of the world. And in verse 47 we read, Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calls for Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. So they continued to mock him, they continued to revile him, they continued to add to his suffering, 
You know, Matthew does not record this, but one of the other Gospels does. When Jesus cries that he thirsts, he says, I thirst. And in response to that, they give him vinegar, which of course would do nothing to in any way alleviate his pain, only add to it. And so they continue to revile, continue to mock. And then in verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. John's Gospel tells us that the second to last thing Jesus cried while on the cross was, it is finished. The, pe- the price was paid. There's nothing left to be done now. There's nothing that man can do to add to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is finished. The last thing Jesus cries is, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And at that point, with that cry, as Matthew says, he yielded up the ghost. There in verse 50. And those words, yielded up, very, very important and interesting words, they mean to give over or to deliver up the spirit. Now, usually when people, you, we read about them giving up their ghosts or, or dying in any way in, in the Bible, the, the word means simply that their, their breath left them. They died. They had no control over it. They just died. That's not what this means, though. This means, this phrase in the Greek language literally means that it is Jesus who gave up his spirit. You see, nobody could take the life of our Lord. He willingly gave it up for us. And that is exactly what Jesus said he would do. In John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, this is what Jesus said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Again, no man took the life of our Lord. He willingly laid it down. He says, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. And that's what we celebrate this this morning and every morning, that Jesus died willingly for our sins. He was buried, but then he rose again. And so, yes, he yielded up the ghost, but he did so. No one took his life from him. He willingly, at the time of his choosing, gave up the ghost. You know, many people, most people, when they were crucified, Jesus was not the only one who was ever crucified. That was something the Romans did. And it took days sometimes until they would die. Not so with Jesus. He chose to yield up the ghost. When it was finished, he yielded up the ghost. He laid down his life for us. He took it back again for us. And in verse 51, this is an incredible event that took place. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two, or torn in two, from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks were torn or split. This is an incredible event. Right here. What this is talking about is in the temple, as we know, the center of religion to the Jewish people, the center of everything, their religious life, really their life as a whole was the temple. And in the temple, you had the holiest place, and then, or, the, or the holy place, and then the most holy place. And the most holy place was a place so holy that only the high priest of Israel could go in, and only once a year on the Day of Atonement in which he made atonement for the sins of the people. That's how holy this place was. And this curtain separated the holy place from the most holy place. When Jesus died, the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom because God did that, signaling that forever the way to God is open directly for all who will believe in him, for all who submit themselves to Jesus Christ and his work. We have direct access to the throne of God. That is something that people did not have until the time that Jesus died. That is incredible. And by the way, when the high priest entered the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, the people would would wait outside for him to return. Not so anymore. 
our high priest, Jesus Christ, when he entered the Holy of Holies, he tore the curtain down saying, come with me and follow me to the throne of God rather than waiting for me to return. Again, it is unbelievable. The grace of God, the availability that we now have to God, the access to the throne of God for those who repent of their sin. Praise God for that. So that such an incredible event when that veil was torn in two. And something else happened too, verse 52, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And they came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So at the same time Jesus died, we're told graves opened. And some of the saints of God arose, but not until after his resurrection. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept. After Jesus rose from the dead, then some of these Old Testament saints also rose. Why? As a sign. You know, that was obviously an event that doesn't normally happen. And who were these people? We don't know. And what did they do? We don't know. Likely they went to heaven with Jesus as a bit of a foretaste of what 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, the dead in Christ shall rise first, as we're raptured together to be with our Lord forever, one day yet future. But again, the Bible doesn't go into great detail about this, only to say this was a sign. Again, Jesus is risen because he is risen. The first fruits of them that slept, we too will rise. Some of these saints rose. Again, an incredible sign, an incredible event that took place. And this is the power of, of the work of Jesus Christ. But again, it took place after his death, or after his resurrection, not before. Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept. We continue, verse 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Now, did that mean they repented and were converted? It could very well mean that. We just don't know for sure. But let me say this. That right there is the power of the cross. We sing that song sometimes. It's a great song, the power of the cross. And this is what the cross has the power to do. Take those who are reviling our Lord, rebelling against our Lord, hating our Lord, which we all were doing at one point. All men are born with a hatred for God because of our sin and because of his holiness. And it's in the cross and its power, it can take men and transform them from haters of God to lovers of God, from those who will fear God and acknowledge truly this is the Son of God. And truly his work is sufficient for me. And that is what happens at salvation. God transforms our hearts. That is the power of the cross. That can happen when sinners are confronted by the reality of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now something else can happen too. Their hearts can be hardened. Some men's hearts were hardened because of this, and some were softened because of this. And it's up to the Spirit of God to soften our hearts, to draw us to himself. Apart from God, none will be saved. Apart from the Holy Spirit drawing us, no man will draw himself to God. No man is seeking God. God is seeking us, though, praise God. But this is what can and does happen when people are saved. That's the power of the cross. And then in verse 55, And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's children. You know, the Gospels really have a lot to say about these women. There, there were others too. There were many women that had a very important role in Jesus' ministry, and that's always neat to point out. And, and we, to this day, thank God for the many women who have an important role in the ministry of Christ, the ministry of his church on this earth. And, and these women were so devoted to our Lord. As we're going to continue to see as we read here, they were so devoted to our Lord, they just could not leave him. 
And so they were there, they were watching. We know his earthly mother was there as well, another gospel tells us. And of course the pain she was enduring. But there were many women very devoted to the ministry of our Lord, as is the case today, and we thank God for every single one of them. Um, but here we have verses 45 through 56. Again, this is not all the Bible says about the death of Christ, but it's a good little synopsis of some of the events that took place as Jesus died for our sin. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, that he died for our sin according to the Scriptures. We thank God that he died for our sin, or else we would have to die for our sin. We certainly don't want that. So we thank Jesus that he died, but you know what? He didn't just die. And he also did not just rise again. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. And sometimes the burial part of that gets left out. Sometimes when you hear people talk about the gospel, and I'm sure we've all done it as well, people say that Jesus died for our sins and he rose again. Well, that's great, but how do I know he rose again? And how could I know he rose again if he was not first buried and we did not know exactly where he was buried? You know, we cannot forget about the burial of our Lord. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, without the burial, you really can't prove the death or the resurrection. The fact that he was buried proves that he was dead. The fact that the tomb is empty proves that he is now alive. You need the burial. This is a very important part of the gospel message. And let's read about that now. Verse 57. And when the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. Mark and Luke tell us that this Joseph was actually a member of the Sanhedrin the same Sanhedrin that condemned Jesus to death. Now it tells us he specifically did not. He was not one of those who, who wanted Jesus to die, yet thank God Jesus actually did die. <laughs> you know, praise God. But here we have Joseph, a rich man, a member of the council. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Now John's Gospel tells us that another Pharisee helped him do this. That was Nicodemus, the same one who came to Jesus by night in John 3, and that's where Jesus tells us, of course, that, you know, if we believe in him, we'll have everlasting life, right? You know, John three sixteen. everybody knows that verse. So there were two Pharisees here, two members of the council, who were followers of Jesus Christ, who came and they asked for the body of Jesus and they laid it in Joseph's own new tomb. You know, he was a rich man. He had a new tomb for himself and he decided to give it to Jesus instead of himself. You know, we all have a part to play when it comes to worshiping our Lord. This was an incredible act of worship on Joseph's part. We all have a part to play in worship. You know, we all have things we're called to do. We all have things we can do to bring glory to our God, to worship him. This is something Joseph felt he could do, and he did it. And, and praise God, and he is forever remembered for doing that. You know, that's pretty neat. And God will forever remember the little acts of worship that you and I render as well as his children. And so again, he's laid in the new tomb. A great stone is rolled across the opening. And look at verse 61 again. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Again, what devotion. You know, when I read that, I almost want to tear up. Because these women are so devoted. And there were others who were devoted as well. But look at the devotion of these women. And we're going to read about them again here on Resurrection Sunday morning. You know, these women were devoted you know, devoted to our Lord. And let me say, I'll take those people every day, someone who just loves Jesus so much, 
You know, don't you love people who just love Jesus? And I will take someone who just loves Jesus with a simple faith over someone who can explain to me the finer points of every bit of theology, you know, or, or someone who can, you know, recite and explain all the different points of Calvinism and this and that, but who doesn't really have that love for the Lord. I will take the person who loves Jesus every single time. Even if I disagree with them on some of the finer points of theology, I will take that person every single time. Someone who just loves Jesus. These women, they just love Jesus. Jesus. May we just love Jesus. And yes, we're called to study the Word of God and to understand as much as we can. But I sure hope and pray that we just continue to love Jesus no matter what. We don't leave our first love as the church at Ephesus in Revelation, which we're going to begin again on Wednesday. I thank God for people who just love Jesus as these women and verse 62, Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate. And this is really interesting. Saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver, speaking of Jesus, said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. So now these Pharisees and you know, those who had been instrumental in the murder of Jesus, of course he gave up his own life, as we have already established, but those who were crying out for his death and hoping for his death, they remember that while he was alive, he in their minds, threatened, quote-unquote, to rise again if he died, or after he died. And this is so interesting, because they appeared to be thinking about something that the disciples were not thinking about. You know, we read several times in the Gospels that Jesus tells his disciples he's going that he's to die, going to and then he's going to rise again three days later. We read this. And yet we also read that they did not understand it. They did not comprehend it. And correct me if I'm wrong, but when I read these Gospels, after Jesus died, I don't look at disciples who are anxiously awaiting him to rise again. I look at disciples who are scared and are afraid and think that everything they believed in was lost. In this case, it seems as if the Pharisees were thinking about something the disciples should have been thinking about. And isn't that amazing how God allows some people to understand things and others not to offer his specific purpose? What was the purpose? Well, the purpose was that they would not only know exactly where he was buried, but there would be guards present, there would be witnesses present as he rose again. If it was up to the disciples, there would not have been any witnesses present. Maybe the women would have been there. But thank God for this. You know, that is really, really neat the things that God does. And so they go to Pilate and they say, listen, we need to have a guard because we think his disciples are going to try to steal his body and then claim he rose again. And to this day, there are some who say that's what happened. And the utter foolishness of that, that could, that could have been so disproven so easily if that's what really happened, and it wasn't. They could have so easily produced the body of Jesus, found the body of Jesus. Somebody somewhere along the line would have said, yes, it was all a big hoax. And it never happened because Jesus really did rise again. And we know exactly where he was buried. There was even a guard there watching. And we praise God for the way he works these things out. So again, in this case, even the world was used by God to help bring glory to God. That's how big God is, that God can do that kind of stuff. So look at verse 65. This just makes me laugh. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. Well, you know what? It wasn't very sure, was it? And who is man, and who does man think he is? He can somehow stop the plans and the power of God. You know, so Pilate says, here, you have your watch. Go and make it as sure as you can. And they did their best. And they made it as sure as they can. And guess what? It didn't matter one bit. Because when you're dealing with the power of God, it doesn't matter what man does. 
So they had their wives. They made as sure as they could. They went, verse 66, and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So there's no way the disciples could have stolen the body. There's no way Jesus could have somehow revived and moved the stone and then fought off the guard. That's another thing some people say. Again, it's like the people who want to believe evolution versus believing creation. It takes a lot more faith to believe evolution than it does creation. It takes a lot more faith to believe some of these nonsensical stories than just to believe what the Bible says, you know, and I thank God for all that. So they have their watch, they have their their tomb, the stone is sealed, they have the finest soldiers in the world guarding it. Jesus has been buried. And again, let us never forget about the burial of our Lord Jesus. We have the death, but then we have the burial. And then we have the resurrection. Again, the burial proves the death and it sets up the resurrection. It's what ties the two together. If you simply say Jesus died and he rose again, a really good question would be, well, how do you know? You know, I know because of the account of the burial. And we thank God for that. So Jesus died, Jesus was buried, but praise God, Jesus rose again just as he said And that's why we're here celebrating this morning. So let's keep reading now. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, so early on that Sunday morning, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So again, these these women who were so devoted to our Lord, who so loved our Lord, and just so clung to our Lord in his life, and then even after his death, and then after he rose again, clinging to God, loving God. May we be just like that. They're a tremendous example to all of us. And then in verse 2, And behold, there is a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And this was not to let Jesus out. This was to let the women in. This was to let the disciples in. Jesus, if he could raise himself from the dead, did not need any help getting out of a tomb. This was to let the disciples in. This was to let people in to prove the tomb is now empty. We know exactly where he was, and now it's empty. Praise God for that. So he rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. We're told in verse 3, his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. If you're a child of God in here this morning, that verse should encourage your heart. Because here we have the most powerful, most highly trained, the best soldiers in the world guarding the tomb of Jesus Christ. And at the appearance of an angel of God, not even God himself, just an appearance of one of his holy angels, we're told they shake and become as dead men. These Roman soldiers became as dead men when confronted by an angel of God. This is a picture of what does and will happen to the lost world when confronted by God. When God judges the world for its sin. As Romans chapter 3 says, the entire world is found guilty before God. It says that every mouth will be stopped and the entire world found guilty before God. The mightiest men in this world shake and become as dead men when confronted by the power of God. And there's a lot of mighty people in this world today, and a lot of them are very evil people. And every day we read and we see all the evil things they're doing. And yet when God judges them, when God deals with them, be sure they will become as dead men. And be sure that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that should encourage your heart today. If you're a child of God, if you're not a child of God, that should scare you to death. Because that is going to happen to you one day, unless you repent of your sin. They became as dead men. We have no reason to fear man. 
Because greater is he that is within us than he that's in this world. We have the Holy Spirit of God, the third member of the triune God indwelling us right now. We have no reason to fear unsaved man. No matter who it is or what they're doing, we have no reason to fear. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye. And don't you love that? It's for the world to fear, not for God's people to fear. We fear God in the sense that we reverence him. And yes, we are afraid of his power, but we also love him. And we know he loves us. It's for the world to become as dead men, not for us. You know, we were once dead in our sin, now we're alive in Christ. Let them be like dead men, not us. And so they were afraid and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, you who love the Lord, you who are so devoted to our Lord that you followed him to his death, you followed him as he was buried, you now come to see him, and you don't even realize yet that he's risen. Do not fear. It's for the world to fear, not for you to fear. Again, fear not, for I know, he says, that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. And they knew that. Here's what they did not know. He is not here. For he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. And again, if we did not know where he lay, we could not do that. That's why the burial is so important. Come, see the place where he lay. And I'm sure shortly after that, by the thousands, people were going to see the place where he lay. And they knew it was now empty. Praise God. But look at that. He is risen as he said. I like what the angel says to the women in Luke 24, verse 5. Again, the same story. Something he also said was, Why seek ye the living among the dead? How neat is that? Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. We are alive in him, praise God. Why seek ye the living among the dead? So come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly, verse 7, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. They did exactly what the angel said. I'm sure with the greatest joy they could have, fear and joy, they're told. Not the fear that the soldiers had, though, that reverential fear of God and great joy. The soldiers had no joy as they became as dead men. And we're told in verse 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, Behold, Jesus met them. Talk about great joy. (laughs) That is, again, saying, All hail, or O joy. Imagine that meeting. (laughs) Again, if you're these women so devoted to our Lord, you're there when he dies, you're there when he's buried, you're there now, to find out he's risen from the dead. And you go and you do what the angels say. And and you're going to go tell the disciples and you're so filled with fear and joy. And here you meet Jesus himself saying, Oh, joy. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Unbelievable. Again, they were so devoted to our Lord. All they wanted to do was cling to him. You know, I said, these women are such an encouragement to me and such a challenge to me as well. I want to be more like them, just clinging to the Lord, holding him by the feet, worshiping him. That's what we do when we come to the cross. You know, we cling to the cross for salvation. We cling to our Lord for salvation. We cling to his mercy. We cling to his grace. And we worship him. You know, we worship him. And then Jesus said unto them in verse 10, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. And we read in the Bible about many post-resurrection appearances of our Lord. And I love how he calls them his brethren. Because that's what we are if we're in Jesus Christ. We too are sons and daughters of God, 
joint heirs with Christ, the Bible says. We are the brethren of our Lord. Again, this is the most unbelievable stuff. The incredible grace and mercy of God, and it's fitting that he appears to these women, and it's fitting that they cling to him, and he brings joy, and he brings peace, and he brings confidence that he, they're going to see him again. And actually, at the end of this chapter, he's going to say to them and to all of us by extension as his children, that I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. There's never a moment in which Christ is not with us as his children. That needs to encourage our hearts as well. And so we just praise God for these things. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then all would be lost. All would be hopeless. The Apostle Paul writes in, again, 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. He says in verse 17, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. You see, if Jesus Christ did not really rise from the dead, then he was not really the sacrifice for sin, the substitute for sin. In which case, he's still dead, and we too are still dead. We are dead in our sins, we are destined for hell. And not just us, but the entire world. As there's only one way to salvation, that's through Jesus Christ. He says, They also which are fallen asleep in Christ would also then be perished. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If Jesus Christ did not rise again, we are miserable. We are hopeless. We are just playing a religious game that means nothing like every other religious game that's played in this world. But thank God, he is not dead. Yes, he did die, and he died once, as the Bible says, for our sin. But he was buried. He rose again. Jesus is risen. We're going to close now, and I want to close with this. In John's Gospel, John chapter 11, Jesus says something to Martha. You might recall Mary and Martha. They had a brother, Lazarus. Lazarus had died in this chapter. Jesus had come to raise him from the dead. Prior to doing that, though, he speaks to Martha, and he says something. We read, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, and, and to believe in him is not just to believe facts about him. If that's all it took, then every demon in hell would be saved, because every demon in hell knows with certainty that Jesus Christ died for sin and was buried and rose again. To believe in him is to love what you believe, is to believe in his person and in his work and to be following him. As Jesus says in John 10, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they follow me. His sheep follow him. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then here's the question that he asked of Martha, and he asked of every single one of us today. Believest thou this? So Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? And do you believe that even if you die, you shall live? And in me you shall never really die, because death is just a door to the next life for us. We already possess eternal life, even as we speak, if we're children of God. But the question is, Believest thou this? I will say that is the most important question you or I will ever have to answer. That is the most important question anyone who's ever walked this earth will ever have to answer. Some do believe, 
And some like these women cling to our Lord and they love our Lord and they're so devoted to our Lord. And I pray that's us here today. Others, unfortunately, even when the facts are staring them in the face, choose to reject. If we were to keep reading here in Matthew 28, we would see that those soldiers, those same soldiers who became as dead men, they go and they speak to the Pharisees and the chief priests and they tell them what happened. And the chief priests and the Pharisees, at this point, knowing that Jesus rose from the dead, pay the soldiers and tell them to say that his disciples came and stole the body. That is the hardness of man's heart. You see, you cannot argue someone into heaven. You cannot convince someone that Jesus truly is Lord. Only a work of grace in the heart of an individual will cause them to believe these things. So some believe, some reject. The question before each of us, believest thou this? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you today again for your grace. We thank you, God, for your love and your mercy. And Lord, we just pray that, that you will work today in our hearts, in our lives, in the hearts, first of all, of those who are truly saved in here, God. And our hope and prayer is that everyone is, but God, only you know. God, those who are saved in here today, we pray that you will touch them, that you will encourage them, that you will encourage us, God, with these truths that every single day...